Dr. James Cheryl Montgomery, the house chaplain, has offered prayer. The chaplain has spoken of the night around us and the faith which will bring us through. Let us live alive and free, he prays. And he speaks of faith, hope, conviction, and heroism. The galleries are slow in filling. There are still empty seats. There appear to be not as many congressmen here now as on Monday when some were missing because they had been in far corners of the country when the hurry call for them was sent. There is not quite the tension of Monday. More now, there is a feeling that the expected has happened. The bottom has been reached. Civilization, like a house of cards, depressed by an evil hand, has collapsed into little bits. Grimly, we proceed to fight through the cluttering wreckage wrought by the warlords of aggression. The House is now going on with its regular business while waiting for the messenger from the White House who will bring the presidential messages dealing with Germany and Italy. When the messenger arrives, he will be escorted down the center aisle by the assistant doorkeeper, Ralph Robert. And Mr. Robert will say, Mr. Speaker, a message from the President of the United States. The declarations of war will be introduced in each chamber immediately after the presidential messages have been read. The declarations will read like the one adopted in the case of Japan, but in this case, Germany and Italy will be substituted. The resolution will, in the case of Germany, will read as follows, declaring that a state of war exists between the government of Germany and the government and people of the United States and making provisions to prosecute the same. Whereas the imperial, the government of Germany has the people of the United States, therefore be it resolved that the state of war between the United States and Germany, which has thus been thrust upon the United States, is hereby formally declared. And that the president be and is hereby authorized and directed to employ the entire naval and military forces of the United States and the resources of the government to carry on the war against Germany. And to bring the conflict to a successful termination, all of the resources of the, of the country are hereby pledged by the Congress of the United States. Again, Senator Connolly, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, will offer the resolution on the floor of the Senate, and Majority Floor Leader McCormick will offer the resolution on the House floor. Already the rules have been suspended here in the House, so that after the presidential messages have been read and the resolutions declaring the existence of war have been offered, the vote will be immediately taken. Those who were once isolationists have closed up ranks. They stand shoulder to shoulder with those who always supported the administration. Japan's treacherous attack cast the die. It was accepted on Monday by almost all congressmen that Germany had urged Japan on to the assault. But now there is the additional and overwhelming consideration that Germany and Italy have already declared war. We simply take up the challenge thrust upon us. The House has now gone into recess, subject to the call of the chair, while they wait for the President's message. How do those who were once critics of the White House policy now express themselves? Well, take Senator Taft, the Ohio Republican, for example. He says the President will have the unlimited support of every American in the all-out war which he predicted will last at least five years. And Senator Nye, last-ditch isolationist, in former days said, in light of recent developments, it is not surprising, terribly regrettable, inviting of immediate retaliation. There should be a quick declaration of war. We should go into it with the knowledge that no matter how long it will take, we can and will win the war. And Senator Austin, Vermont Republican, says, this adds nothing to our knowledge that the United States is and has been an object of Hitler's aggression. But it is a good thing for some reason, for some reasons, one of which is that it will terminate the sniping which might otherwise have continued within the United States. And Austin added, to make the formal expression of the situation complete, the United States ought to declare war promptly upon all of the Axis powers. 
and Senate Majority Leader Barclay declared, inasmuch as Germany and Italy have declared war on us, there is nothing to do but tighten up our belts, gird our loins, and go to it. Now here's a bulletin. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee has unanimously approved the resolutions recognizing a state of war, the existence of a state of war with Germany and Italy. Still, the House and Senate are waiting for the special messages to come from the White House, which will ask the Congress to declare the existence of a state of war. Meantime, there's been a very interesting press conference at the War Department. Secretary of War Stimson has announced that General MacArthur, the commanding general in the Philippines, has confirmed the sinking of the 29,000-ton Japanese battleship Haruna, or a battleship of the same type, sunk yesterday by the American Army Air Forces north of Luzon. Mr. Stimson reported continued attempts by strong Japanese forces to establish themselves along the northern coast of Luzon. Determined resistance has confined this action to the attack in the vicinity of Apari at the extreme northern tip of Luzon, where the Japanese attempted to establish a beachhead yesterday. Air activity continued in the vicinity of Manila with intermittent attacks on airfields at Cavite and Nichols Field throughout the day. Stim Mr. Stimson made his announcement quietly to a large press conference at the War Department. He was composed, cool, and occasionally he made personal comments. When he had been Governor General of the Philippines, he recalled, he had had difficulty in just getting himself through the mountains of northern Luzon by himself. The Japanese, he said, would have a hard time getting an army through those mountains. Secretary Stimson reported that we are strengthening our own defenses everywhere. He did not know the full details as to the Sunday attack on Hawaii. There is no time now for recrimination, no time even for investigation. That will come later. Now is the time, said Mr. Stimson, for preparation and action. Now, while we wait for the presidential messages to come up from the White House to be read in the Senate and House, we send you back temporarily to New York. Now, Kate, I don't see any reason to return to you, so I think I'll just give our closing commercial and then we'll sign off. Back at the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., and now the message from President Roosevelt has arrived. The reading clerk will read it to the House. We take you to the platform. Congress of the United States, on the morning of December 11th, the government of Germany, pursuing its course of world conquest, declared war against the United States. The long known and the long expected has thus taken place. The forces endeavoring to enslave the entire world are now moving towards this hemisphere. Never before has there been a greater challenge to life, liberty, and civilization. Delay invites greater danger. Rapid and united effort by all of the peoples of the world who are determined to remain free will ensure a world victory of the forces of justice and of righteousness over the forces of savagery and of barbarism. Italy also has declared war against the United States. I therefore request the Congress to recognize a state of war between the United States and Germany and between the United States and Italy. Franklin D. Roosevelt, The White House, December 11, 1941. Gentlemen from Massachusetts, Mr. McCormick is recognized. I move the message of the Senate be referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs and Audit Committee. Eric Severide has just come over from the Senate side of the Capitol, and he'll tell you now the Senate's action this morning. Mr. Severide. You've heard the President's message to Congress as read by the clerk here in the House of Representatives from where we are broadcasting. I have just come through the corridor from the Senate. The Senate was through with the action much quicker. They are now just finishing their vote on the joint resolution 
which was introduced by Senator Tom Connolly, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And here is the Senate vote, as taken just now. It is 88 to nothing. The vote is unanimous there. The House is now just considering the resolution and will commence its voting very soon. The, at 12.20 exactly, the Vice President announced that the Senate will receive a message from the President of the United States. Now, then came the President's message there, read by the clerk, just as you've heard it read here on the House side. It took exactly two minutes to read it. Then Senator Connolly was up at once and announced that he had called earlier this morning a meeting of his Foreign Relations Committee and that they had authorized him to say that they approved, all of them approved the resolution as he was now presenting it. Then there was an interruption for a moment as Congressman Bloom, the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee, arrived to confer about the wording of the bill, the resolution, with Senator Connolly. Uh, then the roll call began at exactly 12.26. There was no debate of any kind, no speeches offered, and the vote went on to its finish, which you've just heard, 88 to no votes against. And now, while the, Senate, while the House continues again, I'll read you the only change there was in the resolution. The words, it is the same resolution, as a matter of fact, as the one passed on Monday declaring a state of war with Japan. The only thing that has changed is, of course, the name that the imperial government of Japan is substituted uh, and the government of Germany is inserted. And instead of the words, has committed unprovoked acts of war against the government and the people of the United States, it now reads, the government of Germany has formally declared war on the government and the people of the United States. And now I understand that the further votes have come in from the Senate from persons undoubtedly who were absent, and the vote now stands at 90. There were, the, the, and none against, of course. There were five or six people absent, including Senator Wagner, who was ill, Senator Wheeler, who was with his uh, ill brother in Boston, Senator Tidings, Mr. Bone, and one or two others. The President's message, having been read in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate, Resolutions, of course, have been introduced in both houses, and war has already been passed in the Senate, as Mr. Severi told you just a bit earlier. Thus, we conclude this program from the floor of the House of Representatives in the United States Capitol building, and we return you now to New York. <laughs>